So again, hi everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased uh, to welcome you to our uh, Power Rectifier webinar series. Today we're going to have the first session of the series. Uh, and before we dive into uh, the topic, I would like to briefly introduce today's presenters to you. So um, again, my name is Ole Thumsen. I'm working as a product manager for Nextperia uh, since 2020. And I am responsible for the portfolio management of our power rectifiers. Then we have uh, Nima Lotfi with us. And Nima is our product application engineer. And he is in charge of giving application support to our product group. And then um, we have Juan in the, in the call. Juan is a physicist and he is part of our development team. So with that, let's have a look on today's agenda. First of all, for those of you who are not that familiar with Nexperia, I would like to give a short introduction. Then Juan will explain some rectifier principles. He will show uh, how a basic PN junction is constructed and uh, introduce some other uh, rectifier technologies. Then in section three, uh, I will highlight the most prominent and relevant data sheet parameters and then in section four, I'm gonna show a short movie how semiconductors are made. In section five, Nima will give some application examples and therefore he will focus on the reverse polarity protection and um, explain what is key in these kind of applications. Then in section six, we will wrap up everything. And then in the end, we will have a Q and A session to answer your questions. So with that, uh, let's start with a short introduction. Nexperia is an established semiconductor manufacturer. Our roots are going back to NXP and previously to Philips semiconductors. So that means in total, we have more than 70 years experience of, um, of the semiconductor development. In total, we have 15,000 employees. And in 2021, we have generated a revenue of more than two billion dollars and as i've seen that nima also already switched off the camera uh, i think we're going to do the same simply for better bandwidth and especially when we're showing the movie i think it makes sense to switch it off um so uh, we have one of the highest industry capacities uh, in a year we produce more than 100 billion pieces and we are perceived by our customers and also by the market as a high volume quality supplier so we have a very strong focus on on zero defect and also a lot of our products uh, will go into automotive quality um, automotive applications and therefore uh, highest quality standards uh, are key for us we have a very broad range of semiconductors in total we have more than 100 different packages and on the next slide you can see some um, parts from our portfolio and this includes for instance bipolar transistors protection devices but also mosfet technology or analog and logic ic's and especially in the recent years we are stepping up uh, and entering the power area so we have also gun feds, IGBTs, or silicon carbide rectifiers in our portfolio. In total, more than 15,000 parts are available, and we are extending our portfolio roughly by 800 parts a year. So with that, I would like to hand over to Juan, um, who will explain the rectifier principles. All right, thank you, Ole. So yeah, I will start to explain a little bit um, how yeah we can understand the rectifier, how we understand the diode in this core principle. And if we speak about core principle of the diode, um, we're speaking about yeah the two main uh, effects which we have want to have the diode in uh, in forward direction. We want that the diode will so to say allow current to flow, <clears throat> and in the reverse direction, we want that the diode is uh, so to say blocking the current. And really to understand these two effects, uh, we just have a really briefly look at uh, how normally the diode is, is, is based on. <clears throat> uh, 
and the classical diode uh, we would call this a PN diode, so really a, a semiconductor semiconductor junction, a PN junction, um, as sketched in the left hand side of the graph. So basically, what we have is we we have a N-type substrate, so we have a silicon substrate which is like slightly dope, and uh, on top of this we have some kind of N minus um, dope layer, so a different kind of uh, doping. On top of this we have a P plus layer which is uh, uh, dope it differently. So basically, this is how uh, how the diode is itself is constructed. And as I said, what we want to have is we want to have that the diode is is, is blocking uh, in certain direction and is is allowing current to flow in in other direction. And the core of this uh, yeah principle is really based on this kind of doping. And as I already said, uh, so the n minus doping means that here we 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 dope the the semiconductor in this case silicon with additional um, atoms which uh, introduces additional um, um, charge carriers. The same for the P plus layer here, the opposite um, charge carrier is, is introduced to the cell via implantation. And um, in its core, this is the main principle. So bringing two different kinds of um, dopant semiconductor in contact and this will allow the main principle of the type. Um, yes. Um, over, uh, uh, these two parts, so to say, uh, um, are contributing to the overall um, forward um, direction. So, as I said, uh, forward direction is meaning that the diode, the diode is, the diode is um, allowing current to flow, and uh, the junction itself and also the cold drift layer is playing an important role um, for the forward direction. The drift layer um, is important later to distinguish between different kinds of diode technology. Uh, and yeah, to overall make the diode work, yeah, we have to contact the, the semiconductor layer with the outside world, so to say. Uh, we do this uh, yeah, with uh, metal contacts, defining then ultimately the anode and the cathode. And um, yeah, so these are the main building blocks, so to say, to, to construct a diode. So now let's have a closer look really to the junction itself. So how really the, the main functionality of the diode is, 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 is based upon. So for this, um, we now uh, take a closer look on an atom, com atomic level, what is happening really. Uh, if we put a P-type and N-type uh, semiconductor into context, so really create this kind of P-N junction. So on the left-hand slide, you see a sketch, uh, really uh, the p dop region and the n dop region. And if we now look uh, what is really happening on an atomic level, that, yeah, as I already said, the P-plus region is doped with uh, with a material which has uh, one more positive charge carrier than the silicon, vice versa, the N minus uh, region is doped with the material which has uh, one more electron, so to say, as compared to silicon. And um, the important thing now here is that if we put both into contact, um, we see um, already on this sketch that uh, on the left hand side we have more positive charge carriers than on the left, and vice versa for the negative charge carriers. So bringing th those two in contact uh, will induce the diffusion, just based on the concentration difference of these kind of um, charge carriers, right? So the, the um, charge carriers will, uh, will, uh, will start to move, and we start to move into the other, so to say, junction or other other part of the material. And here, the both the um, charge carriers will annihilate and uh, sort of say vanish, and this leaves over uh, the 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 core atoms, so to say, the dopant atoms, which still have uh, stand charge. And um, as you can see on this picture, we have at the junction now a, a region uh, where we have positive and negatively charged atoms. But you can also see in this sketch that um, we have no more excess charge carriers, which are mobile, right? So this region is somehow depleted. And that's why this region is also called the depletion region. And the depletion region in sum is neutral because we have the same, so to say, charges on the left or on the right. And uh, with this formation of this depletion region, uh, and we don't apply, let's say, an external voltage, the diode is, is not conducting. You can imagine that uh, because uh, in the depletion region, there's just no uh, excess charge carriers to contribute to the transport. We just have zero net current. And, and this is so the stay in non biased uh, condition. An important here now to understand is 
that this depletion region can be manipulated with external biases. And this is really the, one of the key uh, um, effects we really um, exploit in semiconductors or in uh, semiconductor junctions. We cannot play with this depletion region um, by, yeah, ex, um, by applying external biases. So in the first case, so to say, we apply a positive bias. So to say, we apply a, a forward bias, which we will call it. So how would this look like on, on the atomic level? So again, you can see here the state of the diode or of the PN junction um, in the unbiased condition. If we now positively bias the, the, the system, meaning that we positively bias the anode and negatively bias the cathode, we introduce additional charge carriers into the system. And this charge carrier will then move to the depletion region, right? <clears throat> and again, will sort of say stick to the atoms which are left there and ultimately this will result that the depletion region itself will vanish and therefore if there, we don't have a depletion region left over we uh, yeah have sort of say over overall the overall system enough charge carriers the diet itself becomes conductive on this slide you can already see one important parameter which is really governed by the diode itself. You need a certain voltage or you need a certain amount of electrons to be put into the system in order to make the diode conductive. So this is normally then specified as the forward voltage or the forward voltage drop. So you need a certain amount of voltage in order to make the diode conductive. And this parameter is very fundamental uh, if you want to distinguish between different diode technologies. For instance, silicon has a very specific forward voltage drop and if you want to change this you have to alter the system or switch to other diode technologies okay here important then to note forward voltage drop is somehow determined how or when the depletion region really vanish we can now take the, um, the another step what if we bias the system in reverse bias meaning we negatively bias the anode and we positively bias the cathode Again, here you see uh, first the picture in the in the equilibrium state, so meaning we don't bias at all. But if we bias in reverse direction, we just push even more charge carriers out of the system, right? So the the, the, elect the electrons and the positively charged um, um, charge carriers will push even more out of the system. You can already see from the sketch this will increase the depletion region, right? So the depletion region with a reverse bias will increase. And this will sort of say enable the second um, property of the diode. So in the reverse direction, we increase uh, the depletion region. This will allow no current to flow really. And this will create sort of say the blocking state of the, of the diode of the vector form. And here again, we can already derive one second important parameter of the diode. What is the blocking voltage? So how much voltage really we can apply and the diode is still sort of say in this blocking state. So still the depletion region itself is uh, yeah, big enough to re-block any current flow. Another important parameter you cannot directly see from this graph, but you can imagine that even though we create this depletion region, we um, yeah, bring the diode in a state which is blocking, we still have some, which we will call minority charge carriers, which we contribute to still to charge um, migration, to charge flow. This, which we call a, um, a leakage current. So although we will block the current to flow, there's still, so to say in the background, some a really tiny amount of current flow. So this is another important parameter, so the leakage current, so the current in reverse direction. And again, this is really determined um, by the technology you use. Here, I stated this is silicon. Silicon again has a very a certain parameter set of a leakage current, but if you want to manipulate to change this, you have to really change the material property. Okay, the next step, we can now think about how can we vary um, not only the PN system, but really introduce another kind of, of layer. So I said in the beginning, PN diet, basically consists of a P uh, region and an N region. And um, yeah, 
one approach to really change this behavior and also change how the, the, the uh, depletion region is formed is to uh, instead using a P plus layer by using a short key method. The short key method, as uh, you can see on the left hand side of the graph, replaces the P region. And effectively, what this means is the metal itself has really a high electron density. So really, a lot of charge carriers are, are, are supplied by the system now. This will really change how the depletion region is formed. And ultimately, what is happening is that the forward voltage drop, which I mentioned because of, yeah, you need to sort of say, vanish the depletion region is now different. With Schottky dials in general, you can, uh, you can uh, yeah, allow uh, current to flow by a small amount of forward, forward voltage. So this is the main advantage of Schottky dial. You can play even more around with this um, system in uh, if you choose another short key metal context. So the, the uh, electron density is somehow also dependent on the material itself you use as a short key metal. A drawback is how the short key diode itself is acting in reverse direction. Again, in reverse direction, important is how the depletion region is formed and how the diode itself can sort of say, uh, yeah, stabilize this blocking um, blocking mechanism. For Schrocki diodes, it's uh, yeah, it's complicated in that sense that it cannot uh, block a lot of uh, 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 the blocking voltage is limited. Not, uh, so a rule of thumb, um, everything below 200 volt, you can see the Schrocki diode is superior. And also one disadvantage of Schrocki diodes in general is that um, that the leakage current is higher compared to classic FPN. Diet. Also here, because since we have now just only one side, so to say, contributing to the depletion region, uh, we just have more leakage current. An advantage, which is uh, which is stated here also on this slide, is the, the very fast switching times. So this would be more a dynamic parameter, but just to highlight already here that short key diodes, in principle, have a very fast switching. So we can now take a next step and really uh, think about really different material classes. So I mentioned that silicon is somehow limited in this kind of regime you, you get uh, in terms of VF, IR, and so on. So to really change the inherent uh, limitations of the material, you have to change the material. So for instance, Nexperia is uh, providing silicon germanium diodes. So germanium itself is also a semiconductor with a slightly lower band gap as silicon. And if you mix silicon and germanium to an alloy and replace this as a P plus layer, you can already play around with the material properties. In a core, silicon germanium diode um, offers the same sort of forward characteristics as the short key diode. So basically we have kind of low uh, voltage drop, but in reverse direction, we just uh, don't have the disadvantages, so to say, of the short key diodes if you just use them. We can now think about other materials, for instance, high band gap materials. And here, as an example, we can um, consider silicon carbide. Silicon carbide has itself very superior material properties. So it has higher band gap energy. It has a, a breakdown field strength. This is 10 times higher. Electron mobility is higher, the thermal conductivity is higher. So overall, very superior material properties compared to silica. And this allows often that we can exploit these properties by building really a, a silicon carbide short key diode and don't, so to say, have the disadvantages of short key diodes. Basically, we can allow this system to have really high blocking voltages up to 600 volts, um, which is not possible. So say, if we just use um, um, silicon uh, short key diodes. So with this technology introduced, we can now try really to, 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 to visualize all the, uh, all the different um, material properties and also all the technologies. So here in this graph, we can now um, characterize these technologies in terms of their maximum reverse voltage, which can be achieved. So in the first slide, I showed you short key diodes, as in, and I already said that this is normally used up to 200 volts. And um, above this, you normally use PN diodes, which we here called uh, 
recovery or fast recovery diets. And um, this, is, this graph is only showing the maximum reverse voltage, but there are more parameters which are important. And here, as I already said, we, we can then think about different technologies, right? So for instance, silicon germanium is somewhere in between short key and PN diets. So here, the, uh, in terms of reverse voltages, it's the same, but we will see later that this will have uh, more benefits than just this. And also silicon carbide, as I mentioned, um, is relevant for, for applications above 600 volt, because here we really can exploit all the material properties of silicon carbide. So here, not, as a reminder, really, it, it's dependent uh, on the application uh, you want to use, which diode technology is most beneficial for, for the terms of application. With this said, uh, yeah, I will hand over to Ole, and Ole will explain more about uh, the data sheet parameters and also uh, yeah, explain a little bit more where you can find uh, the mention, um, parameters I already mentioned, VF, IR, and, and so on. Right, and uh, therefore, first of all, I would like to show a characteristical curve of a diet. Um, and you can find the currents on the y-axis and the voltages on the x-axis. And the shape of the curve is again determined by the transport of charge carriers through the depletion region. And if now a forward voltage is applied, in the beginning, there is almost no current flowing, but if this voltage exceeds then a certain threshold and there's large amount of current starting to flow, and by that also the resistance value of the diode uh, decreases. So the, the uh, diode becomes conductive. And if a negative voltage is applied, um, the depletion region is then still acting as an insulator up to a certain voltage um, where the diet is becoming instable and is going into a breakdown mode. And therefore, first of all, um, here are some typical parameters linked to the shown curve. First of all, very important is the forward current. Basically, this is the current which flows through the diet. Then we have the VF parameter. So this is the voltage drop across the diode, and this yeah, usually is generated by a certain forward current, which is applied to the diode. Then we have a parameter, which is called the IFSM rating, and this rating indicates the maximum forward surge current in a single pulse event. So in case the diode has to withstand a certain inrush current, this would be the parameter to look at. And then we have the reverse direction. And Juan mentioned the reverse leakage currents already. These play a crucial role, especially when we look at static parameters. And the reverse leakage currents show how much current is still flowing in the blocking mode if an external voltage is applied. And the VR stands for the reverse voltage. In this case, the breakdown voltage or the maximum reverse voltage indicates the maximum voltage which can be applied safely to the diet. And now I would like to give a real example extracted from one of our data sheets. And first of all, I would like to show the forward characteristic over temperature. Um, the curve now looks slightly different and this is mainly due to the y-axis because here it is indicated in a logarithmic scale and not in a linear scale as, as shown before. And if you now check the yellow curve, for instance, this would be the characteristics at room temperature. And if now the forward current of one amp is applied, you have something like 850 millivolt, uh, millivolt of forward voltage drop. And if the temperature increases, for instance, if you have a very hot application and this operates at elevated temperatures, you have lower VF values. And uh, as a rule of thumb, um, the VF decreases by around two millivolts per Kelvin. You increase the temperature. And this uh, concept is valid for basically all types of, of diets. And also we would 
like to take a look on the reverse direction. And also here, uh, we have an example from our data sheet. So again, let's check out the yellow curve, which indicates the behavior at room temperatures. In this case, um, at room temperatures, we have reverse leakage current in the order of nanoamps. And if the temperature increases, um, you have to consider reverse leakage currents, which rise exponentially with the temperature. So at 125 degrees C, so the purple curve, you have leakage currents already in the order of microamps. And also, again, this uh, concept is valid, of course, for all diet types. And now what we did here in this graphic, we are trying to benchmark and compare the introduced technologies. And on the y-axis, you can find the reverse leakage currents and on the x-axis, the forward voltage drop. And first of all, short rectifiers are well known for their efficiency. They have a very low VF, but this always goes at the expense of accepting higher reverse leakage currents. And on that curve, um, with using a different Schottky barrier metal, different points on that curve can be achieved. Then we have our PN or recovery rectifiers. They usually have a higher VF value, um, but always extremely low um, IR values, which make them more stable over temperature. And last but not least, we have silicon germanium. And um, silicon germanium shows a very nice trade-off between a low VF and low reverse leakage characteristics. And with that, I would like to show the manufacturing process to you. And therefore, uh, we have a short movie, which I would like to show to you. So the production process um, starts with sand or with silicon dioxide. But as you can imagine, we cannot uh, take any kind of sand for that. It has to be ultra pure polysilicon. And from that, a uh, long cylinder is created. This is now then sliced into very thin and fragile wafers. And here's an impression from our wafer fab in Hamburg. So now to build a functioning semiconductor, first of all, the electronic circuit design has to be generated. And this is usually done by our R&D experts, like by Huan, for instance. And these designs are now transferred onto the wafer. This involves many different process steps. For instance, uh, metallic depositions, lithography steps, or also etching processes. And in average, one of our power rectifiers, the eight inch wafers will have more than 10,000 dies on a single wafer in average. And then, yeah, finally, the processed wafers are shipped to our assembly and testing facilities and the dyes are separated from the wafer. This is what you can see here. Um, then the, the dyes are transferred into a package outline. And again, this includes many, many process steps, like for instance, the dye attach, clip attach, or different molding, stamping, or plating processes. And in a nutshell, um, we've seen some images from, from our FHAPs the supply chain consists of many, many process steps, and the manufacturing is divided into the so-called front-end production. This uh, includes the wafer production. In our case, it is Hamburg, and our back-end production, so the assembly and the final testing of our products. And on the top right, you can see an image of a power rectifier uh, where you see the lead frame and the die in gray color and the die is sandwiched then between the lead frame and the clip and on the bottom picture you can see a real image of our product uh, in which the current then is flowing through the termination in the clip and then vertically through the silicon die into the cathode and with that, I would like to hand over to Nima. Okay, so so far we have been introduced to the working principles of diets and how these are specified in our data sheets. 
So now I would like uh, to look on the decision process on how to select the right diet technology for your application. And for this, uh, we have highlighted on this slide uh, the typical and most prominent applications for power rectifiers. And as you already can see, power rectifiers are represented in almost every application you use in your daily life or common contact with. In some of these applications, um, diets play an important role, in others, uh, a more auxiliary one. Um, but in the end, uh, it's, it comes down to the basic question, is the diet used in a static uh, application or is it used in a dynamic application? And based on this question, uh, a different set of parameters and requirements uh, needs to be considered. And I would like to start uh, with uh, the parameter set for static applications. And uh, so let's look on this slide here. Here we have uh, set on the right hand side two typical applications um, for, for, for static applications for, for diets. And I think the one on the top you have come across uh, uh, in your life a lot of times because uh, this is the reverse polarity protection, which is used to protect um, your system against wrongly connected power supplies. So in, uh, in this case, uh, if we have a, a polarity confused when connecting to your system, the diode will the diode will uh, disconnect from the power supply, and this is an easy way to uh, ensure that your system will survive something like this. And it's also the easiest way to implement it, uh, implement it with just a diode. Uh, on the bottom side, you see uh, a power O-ring, um, and O-ring diodes can be two or more diodes um, are used to connect multiple uh, power supplies together to your system, um, either to increase uh, reliability or the total power, uh, power dissipation of the device. Um, the Xperia offers also dual diodes in one, in, in one package. So you have two diodes in one package where this, this function can be then um, used by one part. So for the static application, um, we need to consider two different directions uh, power can be, uh, power can flow. So we have the forward dissipation, forward power dissipation, and the reverse power dissipation. And for this, um, we come back to the, to the data sheet examples that, uh, that Ola has shown before. So for the forward direction, we need to consider the forward voltage drop and the forward current. And from this, we can calculate uh, in forward bias the steady state loss. So which is equal to the forward voltage drop times the current of your system. And your forward voltage drop again is dependent on your load current, which is equal to the forward current, and the temperature you're operating in. And this steady state loss shall not succeed the total power dissipation of your device. And in the same manner, it goes for the reverse direction. Here in reverse direction, um, the reverse loss can be calculated. Uh, as a product of the, the reverse voltage applied and the leakage current at that reverse voltage, which is also, uh, as Ola mentioned, dependent on the temperature. And of course, the reverse loss uh, shall also not succeed uh, or exceed the total power dissipation. So now we know for what kind of parameters we need to look in our data sheet. So, but this still uh, does not. Uh, give us a uh, guide us to the, to the choice we need to make on diet technology. And for this, I would like to uh, bring up this picture, which Juan showed, where, where we map the, the, the different kinds of diet technologies uh, to their 
maximum uh, reverse work, working voltage. And to, to narrow it down a little bit, um, let's consider a system where we need to uh, block 60 volts in reverse in case of a real polarity protection. And then we see that we can use either a Schottky diode, a silicon germanium diode, or a PN diode, which are stated here as the coverage. And now the question is, for our system, what is the trade-off between the forward voltage drop and the leakage current? And to make this decision a little bit easier, I met um, the different technologies uh, for leakage currents at 60 volts and forward voltage drops at two amps. We choose five diodes. Of these are three uh, short key types. So we have a trench 60 amp, 60 volt two amps, a planar. A uh, low VF type, 60 volt 2 amps, a, a planar low IR, 60 volt 2 amps, a silicon germanium, 120 volt 2 amps, and a PN diode, 200 volt 2 amps. All of these diodes are in the same package, the, the, the CFP5, which you can see in the bottom right, uh, top right corner. And here you can see um, the the, 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 uh, on the x-axis, the, the forward voltage drop, and on the y-axis, in the logarithmic scale, the reverse leakage current. And you can see here at room temperature, the silicon germanium and the recovery uh, uh, rectifier, they have low, um, low leakage currents, but a little bit higher uh, forward voltage drops. And uh, the, the, the chunky types, they have lower um, lower VF uh, compared to the previous ones, but of course then a higher leakage current. So now normally your system is not operating uh, at room temperature, it has elevated temperature. So let's see how this map changes when we increase the temperature. So from the distribution or the positioning itself, it does not change much. Um, silicon, germanium, and PN still offer lower um, leakage currents, um, and the Schottky types still offer lower, uh, lower forward voltage drop. What we can see, what we just learned, that um, for higher temperatures, all technologies will have lower VF. So if we would uh, make a make a summary out of this uh, of, of this there, uh, we can say the shotty diet at the lowest VF, um, the silicon germanium has the lowest IR at room temperature, and the PN diode has the lowest IR uh, at 125 degrees C, and is on par with the silicon germanium diet. Uh, as a side note, the, the values were used, the typical values from the respective data sheets of those diets. So now we know how our devices behave, um, but still we don't know the right technology to choose. And this, um, we try to, to give you a guidance with this slide. Um, here we calculated the power dissipation, uh, the steady state loss in forward direction and reverse direction. For our for two different temperatures, the room temperature and 125 degree, as we have used in our previous slide, and uh, we compared the different technologies in forward direction for two amps and in reverse direction for 60 volts blocking voltage. Uh, on the y-axis, you always see the, the, the power dissipation. Uh, for the reverse direction, we use a logarithmic scale. So let's look at the forward direction. Here we can see, um, as already was given uh, away by the technology map, that the shot key types uh, have the lowest loss in uh, forward direction. And But here also, it's, it's dependent on what type of shot key you use. And 
um, for the lowest loss in forward direction, if this is the, the, the most important requirement for your uh, for your application, then I would advise you to use the planar low VF, uh, low VF type. For the reverse direction, we can see that the silicon germanium shows the lowest conduction loss. Um, and at elevated temperatures, it will be on par with the uh, recovery rectifier. But I still would advise you to use silicon germanium um, device because the forward voltage loss, uh, the forward, the forward uh, power dissipation loss is smaller. And there was one more thing to consider for your reverse polarity application. Um, during startup of your uh, of your of your circuits, um, there uh, can be inrush currents uh, when the, 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 the capacitors are loaded. So, and here it's important that your devices also show the big robustness against transient faults. And for this, um, we have learned that there is this uh, the, the parameter IFSN, so the non-repetitive peak, peak or surge forward current. Uh, is used. So now it, it can be see in, in, in a lot of data sheets you find these values um, specified as either sinusoidal half wave or rectangular pulse. So it is advisable to calculate the integral of uh, I square dt to to eliminate the, the pulse form. And this I have all this we have also done for the different technologies you can see here. And uh, the purple IFSM values, they uh, are recorded with a, a 8 milli, millisecond square wave. And the teal ones are recorded with the 8.3 millisecond sinusoidal half wave. And um, now you can see here, if you calculate the, the integral of I square dt, um, that uh, 50 m IFSM was a uh, 8 millisecond square wave has a higher robustness compared to 8.3 uh, millisecond sinusoidal half wave with 50 amps rating. So this so this shall also give you just the the, the the hint that you should consider the ice wave VT version. But we can also hear that the planar low VF type has also really high robustness uh, against transient pulses, which which just emphasizes uh, that we should consider this type um, before the others. And also silicon germanium shows uh, good robustness to transient pulses. So I hope with this I could uh, I, I, I gave you uh, a good selection guide on how to select your Diode technology for a reverse polarity protection, and you already you could learn that it's, it's that you can get all of these information just out of the data sheets. So um, with this, I would like to go over to the dynamic applications, and you see here uh, a variety of uh, applications where the diet. Uh, has an important has an important role, um, and I mean the most prominent one is probably the full bridge rectifier, which uh, is used to convert AC to DC voltage, but also um, the, the the step down converter or buck converters, um, where the diode and asynchronous types uh, is used to um, provide a free wheeling path for the inductor during the up phase. Um, and in, in flyback converters, we have it uh, for the, the boost diode for the secondary side rectification, and uh, in snubber circuits to uh, to, to dampen uh, overshoots during turning. And of course, if you have a high side driver um, uh, for for for, uh, for converters. Then you also need um, an auxiliary power supply, uh, which provides sufficient gate drive. And here, the bootstrap circuit is always a quite good solution. Um, here, the parameter set uh, will is, is a bit different uh, compared to the steady one because we need 
to look on the reverse recovery characteristics of our diet because they will define um, the turn on losses in your switch and uh, of course bring their own turn off losses uh, 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 with them in the diet. And this reverse recovery chart and the reverse recovery, uh, the peak reverse recovery current, IRN, um, they depend on a lot of parameters. So how much current, current we need to we need to switch off? How uh, fast is the is the, is the rate of change uh, of the current? So the, the the faster we switch, the higher the QR will get, and the higher the IRN will get. And both of these values are, uh, are highly dependent on the junction temperature, and of course, um, with which uh, with which kind of DVDT we are switching. This is also really important. And as this would um, exceed the scope of this um, of this uh, first session, we have decided to 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 spend a whole session just on the switching application and the dynamic uh, characteristics of the diet in the next section. So um, with that, I would like to hand back over to Ole um, to give you a summary of our talk. Right. Thanks, Nima. Um, so yeah, what have we learned in today's session? First of all, the utilized diet technology really determines the essential diet parameters like we've seen that the Schottky diets um, are the the perfect choice if you want to achieve a very low VF but in contrast to that uh, PN rectifiers or silicon germanium rectifiers offer extremely low reverse leakage currents then um, special attention should be paid to the static and dynamic characteristics of the rectifier so uh, Janima has shown us that the static parameters play a crucial role in the reverse polarity protection application, but dynamic parameters like uh, switching times or reverse recovery charge are extremely important to consider in switching applications. Um, yeah, all in all, choosing the, the right diet uh, will definitely enhance the system efficiency. Um, and the final word, um, we have released and published our diet application handbook last year in in case you want to even learn more about uh, diets um, you can visit our website and uh, order a free copy uh, of the handbook and just here a teaser on our upcoming webinars Nima introduced it already um, the second webinar will take place on the 14th of June and in that section, we will uh, focus on the reverse recovery effect. And we will also uh, show how rectifiers contribute to the switching lo losses of a switchboard power supply. Then the third session will be in November. And there we will put the focus on power rectifier packages. For instance, we will explain the concept of the RTH. And also we will benchmark different packages, like for instance, SMABC packages against our CFP packages. And with that, I would like to open the Q&A session. And um, yeah, in case you have questions, please feel free to 